And I'd like to invite and, and, and welcome you all to the, the Humphrey and our exciting evening with uh, Will Steger and, and Jeannie Scott this evening. Um, first of all, how many of you in the audience are science teachers? Okay, now everyone else clap for the science teachers. And, and science teachers, I just was told that I need to remind you to be sure to sign in for credit. So that was my, my logistics as, as I went through here too. But, but one of the, the great things about being able to work here at the Humphrey School, in my opinion, are nights like these, where not only do we um, get to meet and hear fabulous people, but, but also engage in our community on issues that are, are really um, very, very important. And tonight, I'd like to first introduce Will Steger, and then I'll introduce Jeannie Scott. She'll speak for about 25 minutes and then we'll have a conversation um, as, as, as a group and we'll have some time to talk afterwards as well. Um, Will Steger, as many of you know, needs no introduction in Minnesota. Um, he has been working on climate and climate education for a long time through the Will Steger Foundation and has really made an impact both in engaging teachers in the state and around the country, but also students. And through his Arctic expeditions, Antarctic expeditions, he has engaged and, and, the, and, and piqued the, the, the curiosity of, of people all around the world. When I was visiting my brother-in-law in Australia a few years ago and I asked him if he knew any Minnesotans, he was like, oh, well, Will Steger, and could recite and, and name off many of his expeditions as well. So um, I'd like to welcome Will to the podium for some brief, brief remarks. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Elizabeth, and I want to thank everybody for coming tonight, and in particular Jeannie Scott, who's come from the Bay Area here to present. And um, I just want to give a little bit of an introduction. This is part of our, our annual Teachers Institute that, I think it's our sixth annual now, and I actually myself have been doing Teacher Institute since 1987. And as part of the Institute, we always have a uh, presentation uh, in the evening. Last year, the last couple of years, we were here. And um, many of you know of my, my situation, my eyewitness account of climate change. and. Uh, and uh, I have the advantage of having seen it and then coming back with the, with the photos. But um, about six weeks ago, if many of you are aware, we had this uh, biblical deluge uh, in Duluth, Minnesota, which uh, I wasn't there personally. I was up in Ely, but I talked to a number of people uh, since then, and, and it was quite interesting, their reaction. Um, first of all, they talked about after the, the deluge came, then the rain they all, the, there was no transportation, the streets were out, uh, so everything was really quiet. People were walking or biking, and they were c coming to these areas where the rivers came down, where whole parks and parking lots and buildings had washed down, down, down the hill. And there was a sense of, uh, the people that I talked to, they couldn't quite explain what the feeling was, uh, what, they, what they witnessed. And this is the same thing I've witnessed many times over. The Larson Ice Shelf, for example, breaking up uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the Arctic Ocean now that you can't even travel on by dog team anymore because of global warming, because of the open water. And that open water now is starting to destabilize the, the uh, uh, polar vortex, the high pressure system up there. But as predicted some years ago, that th we would be seeing the changes here. We are now seeing the changes. It's pretty hard to deny the 4,000 heat records that we've had. Uh, we have, the last 14 months, we've had the same climate as Omaha, Nebraska has had in the last, in its last 14 months, six degrees above, above normal. Um, within the United States, we've seen floods. Uh, we've seen a massive drought now, that's for the second year. In a geological history, uh, the, uh, the southwestern United States, uh, 20, 30 year old, uh, 20, 30 year old droughts were normal. But uh, we've destabilized this, this whole s system. But despite all this, we still have deniers. People saying, it's not happening. We also have people saying, well, it's happening, but you know, humans aren't the cause. And we have an another faction of people, too, are saying, well, you know, it's part of God's will. It's happening, but God, God will take care of us. But uh, how, do we, what, how do we deal with this challenge? 
I mean, just looking at solutions and what we can do in our everyday life is one thing, but when we're looking at our country, the United States, uh, what do we do in education? How do we, how do we counter this? It's very similar to evolution, as Jeannie will talk about. But it's work, work that Jeannie Scott has been doing, and, and she'll talk about this year and how the directions that we have to go. Uh, here at the Will Steger Foundation, um, we're dedicated exclusively to uh, climate change. Uh, we work in three areas. One is curriculum and uh, uh, teacher education, which is part of the program tonight. And uh, we have a, a climate literacy in Minnesota uh, in the K-12 education system. The other area, the second area we work in is youth leadership. We identify youth leaders uh, that are active uh, in colleges or out of colleges around solutions. It's really this youth population, 15 to 25. Uh, there's a huge opportunity here because uh, they're within the vote or in the voting range or will soon be within the voting range. So we have a potential there of carrying the vote here in the very near future. And the third area that we work with you know, that I'm pretty much personally involved in all the time is uh, climate policy. We're working with the governor right now um, on an energy jobs task force, which you'll hear more about uh, uh, this, this fall. But tonight we're gonna hear from uh, Jeannie uh, Scott, she's going to talk about education, and then we'll have an uh, interaction rapport here. We have questions. We're going to uh, pass out papers so you can write, write your questions on the, on the cards, and we'll continue. And I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. There you go. Thank you. So with that introduction, thank you very much, Will. It's, it's really my pleasure to introduce Jeannie Scott. Um, Jeannie holds a PhD in physical anthropology and has worked for over 25 years on this forefront of creation evolution controversy um, with the National Center for Science Education, where she's been director since the 87, I believe, was it? Yeah, since 1987. Um, and and I, I think that what, what I'm looking forward most tonight is hearing both about her experience with uh, the nature of science, but also the science of nature, particularly how it pertains to evolution, and now how the National Center for Science Education is applying it to climate change, and both the similar lessons from the decade-long um, fight to make sure that evolution is taught in schools as science, um, and, and what lessons we can draw then for climate change are also very important. Um, you're familiar probably with states like Louisiana and more recently Tennessee allowing educators to challenge um, accepted science in, in climate change and evolution. You might not be aware that this last spring in Bemidji in Minnesota there was a, a, a large debate in the school system there that was trying to um, break down the pillars of, of evolution in the school system with someone on the school board supporting it. Um, so this isn't just other places, it's also here in Minnesota. And I'm hoping that we can engage also in a conversation about what these types of questions and controversies mean for us in our state as well. Um, this year, when Jeannie launched the NCSE's climate initiative um, in response to attack on climate education, um, NCSE has also has been very involved in trying to structure what that exactly looks like, and I hope we can all be part of that conversation. Um, Jeannie holds, uh, has, has been awarded many different uh, um, um, honorary degrees, and also hold, was recently received the Public Service Medal from the National Academy of Sciences, and awards from the American Academy of Sciences and others. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome Jeannie Scott to the podium, and I look forward to this conversation this evening together. Thank you. Well, good evening, and thank you so much for coming out on such a lovely summer afternoon. It would have been so much easier just to sit on the back porch and have a cold one instead of coming in to hear a talk about science, for crying out loud. So uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm honored by your presence. I'm also very honored, of course, to have, be presenting at the Humphrey Institute, and I thank the Steger Foundation for inviting me to talk about a subject that is both of importance and is also quite vexing. Let me tell you a story. 
Last spring, the Tennessee legislature passed a bill that called for teaching the strengths and weaknesses of evolution. Now, when I speak to university science departments, what I often will do is ask the biologists and geologists, excuse me, could I please have a list of the evidence against evolution? And everybody laughs heartily and I go on with my talk. Because scientists don't have that list because it doesn't exist. The National Academy of Sciences has been quite clear that evolution is valid science. There's no indication that this scientific discipline has weaknesses. Similarly, in June 2006, 68 academies of science from around the world signed a statement on evolution agreeing that the universe, the planet Earth, living things on Earth have all evolved and that evolution and science should be taught to children. NCSE's little book, Voices for Evolution, collects statements from dozens, yeah, that's a great cover, isn't it? <laughs> that's gotta be the cutest otter I've ever seen in my life. But, um, Attesting to the importance of evolution in science and why it should be taught to students as valid science, not something that should be treated tentatively or something that has weaknesses. So scientists roll their eyes when you ask them to uh, give you their list of weaknesses or that teachers should be teaching weaknesses of evolution, such as in the Tennessee legislation. Now, does this mean that 100% of all scientists agree that evolution occurred? No. There are scientists who deny that evolution has occurred. Now, lawyers have a somewhat cynical statement about expert witnesses. For every PhD, there is an equal and opposite PhD. <laughs> and unfortunately, many citizens seem to feel the same way. If there are those who deny the legitimacy of evolution as a science, then the jury is still out. Yet, for every PhD accepting evolution, there is not an equal and opposite PhD rejecting evolution. The percentage of scientists denying evolution is minuscule, especially among evolutionary biologists, who are the ones who can speak most authoritatively. It just simply is not true that there is an equal and opposite PhD. Well, interestingly enough, the Tennessee bill calls not only for the teaching of strengths and weaknesses of evolution, but also for treating global warming in this same tentative fashion. In fact, a few years ago, NCSE began to notice that in legislation being submitted around the country, anti-evolution was being bundled with anti-global warming, and we were unsure why. Also being bundled were other scientific ideas like origin of life, stem cells, human cloning, there was a whole bunch of science teachers in this audience who raised their hand. Raise your hand if you have a lab on human cloning. No, this is silly. You know, just, this is just not a topic that you find being, you have, that must be a really interesting lab. <laughs> Pardon me? Oh, okay. <laughs> but you get the point. This is, not a, this is not a central part of the high school curriculum and yet it is being treated in this Tennessee legislation and in 40 other bills that we've tracked over the last uh, half dozen or so years. Um, 40 or so bills that want you to treat evolution in this tentative weaknesses, strengths and weaknesses fashion, and also global warming and these other uh, subjects that are bundled. In looking at this, we found a lot of parallels to our uh, understanding of evolution as a, quote, controversial issue. First of all, global warming rejection is a bit more complicated than evolution rejection. It takes several forms. Um, the, most, the strongest form of global warming rejection, um, we can call these people contrarians. I don't really like to use the term skeptics because skeptics is taken. That's people who are in favor of critical thinking and are uh, like Carl Sagan require extraordinary proof for extraordinary claims like those of uh, various pseudoscience and medical quackery and so forth. And, and th those are the skeptics. They've got that term. People who reject the science of global warming are not skeptics. That, that's not part of the deal. So I've been, gra I've been looking for a term to refer to them. They don't like the term denialist, although it's a perfectly reasonable social science term. Uh, so we can just call them the antis. So you'll know what I'm talking about when I talk about the antis. 
The strongest of the antis are those who just completely reject the idea that global warming is happening. Then there are those who accept the science that it is getting warmer, but reject the idea that global warming is anthropogenic, is human caused, or that humans have much to do with it. But yet there's a third component of global warming, anti-global warmingism. See why I call them antis, it's much less clumsy. Uh, they agree that it's getting warmer, they agree that people have a lot to do with it, uh, but basically we can only accommodate rather than prevent disaster. Now, I want you to look at these three claims, these three kinds of claims. Some, you know, are accepted by all, but one and two are scientific issues. Is global warming happening or not? Are people responsible or not? Those are, are sci uh, claims to which science can, can make an important contribution and can uh, help you make a decision. The third, what should we do about it, if anything? That is a policy decision. That is different from one and two. Especially at the level of the science classroom, the policy issues should be treated differently than the, I, than the two components which are answerable through science. Um, my argument tonight will be that the science classroom is not the place to have the debate about what, if anything, to do about uh, global warming. The science classroom is the place to discuss the science and present the science of global warming in an unqualified manner, as scientists understand it, not as something that should be presented tentatively or with weaknesses. But there definitely are similarities between the rejection of evolution and the rejection of global warming. Now at NCSC, for many years, we've had what we refer to as the pillars of creationism. These are the arguments that are used in the uh, anti-evolution movement, have been for decades. They're very familiar to anyone who's uh, studied this movement. Um, and pretty much any argument can fit into one or more of these categories. The first argument is that evolution is weak science. Scientists are giving up on evolution. This will come as a surprise to the scientific community. The second pillar is the ideology pillar, if you will, the idea that evolution and religion are incompatible. The third pillar is a cultural pillar, the idea that teachers should teach both out of a sense of fairness or out of a sense of trying to avoid dogmatism or perhaps to promote critical thinking. Now we have these uh, same kinds of pillars uh, in the anti-global warming uh, movement and the, we can call them the pillars of global warming rejection. The idea that anthropogenic global warming is weak science is something that is quite prominent in the uh, websites and the literature of the, uh, of the antis. As with evolution, we have strong agreement within the scientific community that global warming is real and that people have an important role in producing that. Now, does this mean that every scientist agrees with anthropogenic global warming? No. There are some scientists who disagree. But as with evolution, for every PhD who challenges the science of global warming, there is not an equal and opposite PhD. The percentage of scientists denying global warming is a very small percentage of scientists as a whole, and it is especially a very small percentage of climate scientists, who of course are the ones who can speak most authoritatively. Thank you, that was my next point. I, Apologize, uh, this is such a well-informed audience. Uh, Christopher Mockton is not a scientist, but he is so very vocal as an anti-global uh, warming uh, proponent. And that's a picture he likes, I guess, because it's, you know, <laughs> so I thought I would present. Oh, was he? Ah, very interesting, yeah, see. <laughs> May I point out to the listening audience, more people showed up for this one. <laughs> But, so, regardless of the fact that Christopher Mockton is not a scientist, the general principle of this slide does hold. Um, uh, but let, let's take a look at some of the claims of the, uh, globe, of the antis and see uh, what are they saying about the alleged weaknesses of climate science. Well, when analyzed, the attacks on climate science are pretty unimpressive. Just to take one example. A common anti-global warming-ist 
claim is that it's really not getting warmer. That 1998 was warmer than 2008. And indeed, 1998 was an unusual year for temperature, and looking at 1998 to 2008, there is a decline. But why choose those dates? It appears as if the antis may be cherry-picking the data. From 1997 to um, 2008, there's a slight increase in temperature, and if you go to from 1999 to 2008, it's again an increase in temperature. Why was 1998 chosen? cherry-picked, if you will, to make this comparison. But you know, why stop at 2008? If you add in the last two years of that decade, even from 1998, there's an increase in temperature. But you know, one of the real distinctions is between temperature and weather. Weather is what you experience, temp uh, sorry, between weather and climate. Weather is what you're experiencing. Weather is the short-term um, uh, climatic situation, if you will. Climate is something that occurs over a long period of time, a decade at the very minimum, but preferably over several decades. And if you look at the, um, uh, this argument, yes, indeed, from 1998 to 2008, you have a slight decline, but as I've just shown you, that's a bit of cherry-picking for, uh, for that particular decade. If you look at the last 50 years, though, it is quite clear that there has been a significant warming of temperature. So it's understandable why climate scientists get uh, annoyed when they see their work being manipulated in this fashion. Let me just give you another very quick example showing why climate change contrarians have little traction among scientists. Joseph Bast is the director of the Heartland Institute, which is a conservative organization that opposes global warming on anti-big government grounds. He wrote, National Snow and Ice Data Center records show conclusively that in April 2009, Arctic sea ice extent had indeed returned to and surpassed 1989 levels. Well, now, Arctic sea ice melting is a very important matter that climate scientists have expressed alarm over because it's an indicator of oceanic heating. And oceanic heating is extremely important for economic uh, phenomena like fisheries, for corals, which are related to fisheries, for things like the Gulf Stream, which is what makes it habitable in northern Europe and Great Britain. Um, you know, the warming of the ocean is a very big deal and something that has been uh, very carefully monitored. So this claim that the um, Arctic is not warming is a pretty significant claim. Let's take a look at the data. In this chart, along the x-axis, you have January, February, March, April, May, and so forth. And you have the blue line is 1989, the red line is 2009. When you look at the blue and the red line, uh, at the amount of Arctic ice by month, it's apparent that there is less Arctic ice in the latter part of the decade than 1989. It's only by looking at one point, April, where there's an anomalous crossing of these two lines, where there's more ice in 2009 than 1989. That was the single data point that he picked to try to demonstrate that actually we, are, we should be unconcerned about um, sea ice level in the Arctic. And of course, the data are very clear that over time from 1979 to 2012, the amount of Arctic ice has indeed receded regardless of what happens in any given month. These are the data for the end, up to the end of July 2012, and you can see that there's less and less ice all the time. Uh, I, I don't have time to explain what this graph is about, but it has to do with variations from the mean for the month over time. The second pillar of global warming rejection is an ideological one, as it is with evolution. Now, with evolution, the ideology pi pillar is religious. The claim is that evolution is incompatible with uh, religious views. With global warming, the ideology is political or economic. It's the idea that anthropogenic global warming is an anti-capitalist or a, a pro-big government kind of movement. Uh, it's a liberal plot to increase the power of big government and to take away individual American freedoms. Or global warming is a plot by liberals to threaten American prosperity or security. The economic argument has been called free market fundamentalism. It's the idea that global warming is an attack on capitalism, which is based on the idea that if global warming is true, it will mean a, uh, a need to um, restrict some of the um, uh, carbon energy 
producers, coal, gas, and oil, uh, in a way that uh, free market um, uh, libertarians uh, would, would be loath to, uh, to uh, countenance. There's this idea uh, in the part of some aspects of, of American society, generally associated with the libertarian movement, that the free market is going to solve all problems. We saw how well that worked. Um, and indeed, a Pew 2010 survey found an almost dichotomous distribution in comparing Democrats and Republicans, almost 40 percentage points difference in their acceptance of global warming. Yet the current Republican disinterest in an important environmental issue is historically recent. In the past, there has been a strong pro-environmental component within the Republican Party. And even today, political conservatism is not monolithic on this topic. There is Republicans for Environmental Protection. There are Republicans like George Shultz and certainly the late Ronald Reagan uh, and many other prominent Republicans who are very strong environmentalists who uh, are accepting, uh, well not Reagan because he's dead, but who are accepting of the idea that the planet is getting warmer and people have a lot to do with that. <clears throat> D.R. Tucker, who is a conservative journalist, changed his mind after becoming acquainted with the science behind global warming. And we very much encourage this. Um, we, we think that he's a very good model for how we would like to people, how we would like people to consider the science in forming opinions about this very important subject. Basically, the problem here is dichotomous reasoning, dichotomous thinking. We see this very, very strongly in the evolution issue, where uh, the claim is that there are only two alternatives. You're either a good guy, Christian creationist, or you're a bad guy, atheist evolutionist. Uh, and of course, most Americans, given this kind of a sharp dichotomous choice, will certainly reject evolution if they think they have to give up their faith. America is a highly religious a country. And yet that dichotomy is false. There are many intermediate positions that accept both faith and science. At NCSC, we have a little exercise that many teachers have used called the creation-evolution continuum in which creation and evolution are contrasted, but many intermediate positions, which I won't go into right now, of course, are presented uh, within the uh, religious tradition of Christianity that accepts evolution. Uh, certainly, there are religious positions that do not allow for evolution, but the important point here is that there are many more that do. Certainly Catholics and mainstream Protestants, uh, their formal theology accepts evolution as the way God brought the universe into uh, existence, something called theistic evolution. Now the same kind of um, falsely dichotomous thinking also occurs with climate change, except that the ideology is different, as I was saying. There's the false dichotomy that one cannot be a political conservative unless one rejects global warming. You have to choose. But what's really going on in the political arena is not a discussion about science, but about the consequences of global warming. If global warming is happening, what, if anything, should be done about it. And the, this is really a political or a policy argument, not a scientific argument, as I was uh, introducing uh, the idea before. The endpoints are not, uh, the endpoints are intervention or leaving things alone. And there are many intermediate positions upon which ca people can differ and argue and decide about. But this is independent of the very, very strong science that demonstrates that the planet is getting warmer and people have a lot to do with it. Go ahead and argue about this stuff. This is where the argument should be taking place. Finally, the third pillar of global warming rejection is parallel to that of the rejection of evolution. It's the fairness pillar. This takes a couple of forms. The idea that science should be taught non-dogmatically, students should exercise critical thinking about climate change and so forth and so on. You know, one of my relatives here in Minneapolis uh, commented to me the other day that because so many people believe that climate change was a hoax, teachers should be teaching both sides. I really, it sounded like I was hearing somebody making the same argument about evolution, um, which of course has been made for several decades here, but this is exactly the kind of, uh, of argument that resonates with so many Americans. 
We are a people who have a very strong cultural value for free speech, for letting people's opinions be expressed. Uh, we love academic freedom. We love critical thinking. This, this is a meme, if you will, if I can borrow from evolution again. This is a meme that resonates very strongly with the American public. Unfortunately, it's not really relevant to the big question that we have tonight, which is what should you teach in a middle school or high school science class? Let me try to illustrate that a little further. Mr. Bast from the Heartland Institute has weighed in on this, um, although a bit polemically. He writes, the goal should be to get politics out of the classroom, not protect it by banning debate and censoring objective sources of research. Uh, note the implication that teaching only global warming and not contrarian positions is censoring, banning debate, all these kind of negative um, images. So how do we decide what to teach in science class, and where does the debate come in? Because as Americans, we want to have the ability to express opinions on these issues, and we want to hear both sides and so forth and so on. Well, one thing that we ought to be thinking about in this is that there's a difference between your opinions about what should be done, if anything, about climate change, and the actual climate change science itself. Having seventh graders debate the latter doesn't make a lot of sense because, as I'll try to illustrate, those arguments have already been gone over by the scientific community. My relative remarked that because some people think global warming is a hoax, we should therefore teach that view along with standard science. But then we're deciding what to teach based on the popularity of views. And popular views might be wrong, and unpopular views might be right. For years, history books left religion out. The Catholics gave them a lot of static when they talked about the Spanish Inquisition. The Protestants gave them static when they talked about the witch hunts. Textbook publishers understandably just said, to hell with everything, we'll just, leave, we'll just leave religion out and we won't talk about religion at all. And that was very bad for the education of students in history because students need to know about the role of religion in history. This is an important topic. Social science uh, 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 scholars and teachers have been trying to uh, get religion back into the, uh, the history textbooks as a, an important part of the discipline. The coverage of evolutions clearly has had its ups and downs in the curriculum and in the textbooks, certainly. And uh, in English language arts, there have been battles over whole language versus phonics for years. And there are many other disciplines. The math wars make the Science wars look tame in some respects. Um, uh, conceptual mass, math versus drill and kill. I mean, they, these people really you know, square off. So how do you decide what to teach in a public school uh, class? I don't believe that public sentiment should determine the curriculum, however much this appeals to American traditions of local control of education. However much value there may be to local control of education, Details of the curriculum, I don't think, is one of them. Here's a radical thought. Let's give people who actually know something about the subject matter and how to teach it the biggest say in deciding curriculum. Is this dogmatic? Is this, as Mr. Bast of the Heartland Institute claims, quote, banning debate and censoring objective sources of research? No, but it is getting politics out of the process. Debate about science and the decisions about objective sources of research occurs, but is part of the scientific process. It occurs among scientists, though, not among seventh graders. Scientists laugh at this cartoon. It says, most scientists regarded the new streamlined peer review process as quite an improvement. And you can see these guys ready to whack them. Um, it looks easier than the current system. Uh, scientists get a big kick out of this slide. Um, we have a bunch of science teachers here. Do we have any scientists in the audience? Um, okay, now leave your hands up. Okay, no, hands up, leave it up. Higher, higher, good. I'm not gonna call on you, trust me. I'm not gonna call on you, okay. But this, this is a little exercise, and there's quite a few hands up. Not as many as if this was a different kind of talk, but a lot of hands up. All right, how many, leave your hand up if you have ever published a peer-reviewed scientific paper. Okay, most of the hands stayed up, that's cool. Um, we even got a few extra ones. Good. Keep your hand up. <laughs> Excellent. Um, get your hand up higher so people can see you. Okay. Now, leave your hand up if every 
paper you submitted for um, uh, peer review was accepted the first time through? Yeah, all the hands go down. Guys, we don't promise you a rose garden. That's the nature of the peer review process, right? It's not easy. It's not easy. Let me, yet again, come back, coming back to the big idea. That what should middle school and high school teachers be teaching? They should be teaching the consensus view of science. I propose that if anti-evolutionists or global warming deniers want their views to be taught in high school, they need to convince the academic community. They need to go through that process, not to get their views required by law in state legislatures. Go through this process, and then your ideas will trickle down to the high school class. Here's how science works. Okay. I come up with a great idea. And I want to present this idea to my colleagues. Well, first of all, I have to do the research, right? And then after I've done some research, I'm going to present it to my colleagues for peer review. I'll probably give a paper or do a poster at my professional meetings, and my colleagues will give me feedback. They'll say, Jeannie, you forgot to do this, or you should have done this, and oh my god, you were just so off the wall on this, just forget it, go home and start all over. Or they'll say, well, you know, this is kind of interesting, but have you tried this? So I'll get that kind of um, feedback from my colleagues, and I'll go back and do some more research, and then I'll come back, rinse and repeat. We go around and around and around on this. And after a while, if I think I've really got a good idea, I'll submit it to a professional journal and go through that other ringer uh, with the clubs and all that sort of thing. And if my idea is really good, if it really helps to explain nature, it will go into the scientific consensus. Okay? If it's in the scientific consensus, if scientists find it useful, then it'll trickle down into classrooms in the textbook. Now, let's just say that I find all of this research and peer review to be burdensome. And let's say that it's so much easier for me to go to a state legislator and convince him to pass a law that determines that Jeannie's brilliant idea will just go directly to the classroom <laughs> without having to go through all of that tedious uh, research and peer review. Now, you can imagine that my colleagues would be rather annoyed at me. And I would, uh, I, I would be you know, strongly criticized by my colleagues for, for the unfairness of my cutting to the head of the line. They had to go through a very laborious process to get into the classroom and the textbooks. I took a shortcut. I cut to the head of the line. That's unfair. And it's so amusing that the, both the creationists and the global warming contrarians will present their view as being one of fairness. We're going to teach standard global warming and anti-global warming because it's so fair. No. What is fair is for them to take their arguments to the scientific community, go through that same um, gauntlet, uh, go through that same ringer of peer review that all the rest of us have to go through. And if their ideas are valid, Great, we'll teach them. If their ideas go into the scientific consensus, we're happy to have them in the classroom in the textbook. This is not a religion. You know, global warming isn't a religion. It's something that a lot of people take very seriously because the data are so strong in supporting it. <clears throat> That's what they want to do. So in summary, there are three pillars of rejection, whether of evolution or climate change. There's the science pillar, reject the science, attack the scientist. Some of you are familiar with the uh, excesses of the climate gate accusations of scientists. Uh, out of context emails were used to smear the reputation of some very solid scientists. There's an ideological pillar. In the case of climate science, it is the idea, ideology is associated with politics and economics. A slice of it is associated with religion, it is true. Some small part, but a much smaller part of the anti-global warming movement is from people who believe that God's providence would never let anything bad happen to the planet so we don't have to worry about it. But of course, the most powerful of the pillars of rejection is that of are, are the cultural arguments, the the fairness argument that is that so resonates with Americans that we so want to um, that we so want to uh, reflect and embrace, and it's a wonderful 
wonderful cultural trait. I'm very, very happy to live in the United States where we have freedom of speech, where we have the ability to go down to the school board and give people our opinions. But let's not, convent, uh, let's not confuse the ability to express opinions with scientific research and established explanations. As Carl Sagan once said, you are welcome to your own opinions, but not to your own facts. And there's a distinction there. I think recognizing the pillars and how to deal with them, and obviously I haven't really gone into any sort of detail with how you deal with the pillars. That's something that, that we're learning to do in our new climate change uh, initiative, but it's certainly based on the experience that we've had in dealing with um, the pillars of, of creationism. But recognizing these pillars and figuring out how to deal with them will, I hope, help us make the decisions we need to make, not just about how to teach climate change and what to teach in terms of climate change, but also how to reach our fellow citizens so that we as a society are better able to deal with the challenges that climate change is going to bring in the future, because it's happening and there are implications of this science. We are the National Center for Science Education. You can find us at ncse.com. Our website has a newly created climate science section. We even made it a different color so you can find it. And if you turn to that page, you'll find a number of topics that I hope you will find interesting in pursuing. We will be, like I say, we're just starting out with this initiative. We're only about six months old. We have a new staff member, uh, Mark McCaffrey. Uh, who is helping us uh, develop this program. We will soon add a second staff member. And uh, we will be adding to the website. And um, those of you who are teachers, please do make note of this um, email. I'm scott at ncse.com. If you hear of any colleagues, or if you yourself find opposition to teaching good science, whether evolution, global warming, um, Please let us know, we, we have ways to help you. Um, and we are here to help you, because we believe that good science should be taught. Uh, it should not be qualified, it should not be presented as something that has weaknesses if there are no weaknesses. And certainly in evolution and global warming, that is the case. Well, thank you again for inviting me to be part of the Summer Institute for the Steger Foundation. And thank you so much for coming out to hear me and hear this event tonight. Thank you. Why NCSE um, decided to make the move into global warming? Well, we were harassed. <laughs> Some uh, science, scientist friends of ours who do a lot of workshops with teachers mm -hmm. uh, uh, called us up and said, hey, I'm hearing from the teacher workshops that teachers are getting hammered for the teaching of global warming just like they're getting hammered for the teaching of evolution. We need a climate NCSE. Either we got to reinvent you, or you guys have to take this on. And you know, if you know anything about nonprofits, you don't take on a major initiative easily. I mean, mm -hmm. it costs money. It requires staff. I say it costs money. I'm the director. I have to pay attention <laughs> to things like that. You're so, raising the money that it costs. That was the, that was what was missing in the research. Oh, was the research it's dollars a, it's, that it's you? It's a membership them. organization. Yeah. You all can join. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, we can join online too. Uh, but no, seriously. Um, uh, it's not something that you undertake lightly, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. obviously something the board had to decide. So the staff studied this for the better part of a year. I mean, we, we, we really looked at the, um, at the uh, claims of the, uh, the antis, mm -hmm. and that's when we started noticing, well, geez, it's the pillars all over again. I mean, it's the same, attack the science, make an ideological uh, argument, make a cultural argument, and the same sort of thing. Well, we know how to handle that. We know how to handle that in the evolution field, so to speak. We know how to help teachers deal with this issue on the grassroots level. We don't have the expertise in climate science, but we can hire somebody to give us that, and we can get scientists to advise us. And there's lots of other organizations doing that as well, too. Well, and that exactly. partnership, I'm hoping, will be yeah. fruitful for you right. as you move forward. But our particular, I mean, we don't do curriculum. You guys do curriculum. There are other people who do curriculum. 
Those guys do curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> Steer does curriculum. Um, there are a lot of people who, who you know, produce really good um, mm -hmm. uh, global uh, climate change curriculum. Mm -hmm. That's great. No point in our reinventing that wheel, right? Um, there are uh, environmental organizations that um, will take on um, uh, litigation uh, in various ways. You know, our, our companies uh, uh, despoiling the landscape or polluting or something. We don't need to do that, that's not it. What we do, what we've always done, is help teachers at the grassroots level. We, we really do retail uh, science education, so to speak. If a school board is about to pass a dumb policy or a, uh, even a teacher you know, calls us, I mean, we, we do, most of what we do is behind the scenes. Most of what we do, you will never hear about. You'll hear about the big things like Hitzmiller versus Dover, the intelligent mm -hmm. design trial. You'll hear about some of the big things that we do, but the everyday bread and butter stuff that NCSE does, you'll probably never hear about. Because it's the teacher who calls us up and says, I've got a principal who wants me to opt out little Jimmy here because his parent is a creationist. What do I do? And so we can give that teacher the information and advice that that teacher needs to make a case to the principal mm -hmm. why Jimmy should not be opted out. Well, and Jeannie, I, I can approach you as an educator. Several times, the Center for Science, Technology, and Public Policy mm -hmm. has been invited to host <laughs> science, <A> debate. <laughs> science debates on, yeah. on climate change. Yeah. Yeah. And um, there's this question of, of legitimizing a cause by hosting something like that in an event like this. I know there was recently one um, between Professor, is it Linzer? at mm -hmm. MIT and, and a professor at Texas A&M, and afterwards they talked about the policy issues. But when people see that, what, what do you yeah. think about that? What do you think about those types of It's events? the same position that I've always held about evolution. If you have a consensus view of science that is so strong, it doesn't make sense to confuse the public about the validity of the opposing point of view. Okay? There is something called creation science. It has been shown for decades to be Terrible science. I mean, the, the fact claims they make are just wrong. Mm -hmm. The methodology that they use to uh, come up with their conclusions is just wrong and bad. No, there's no point in giving that a, uh, in treating that as if that is equally valid. Now, the implications of evolution uh, are something that can be discussed. So I, I will debate, if you will, that's not the right word, because you know, I'll have a discussion like this, um, uh, science and religion issues. Uh, but I, mu I much prefer to get somebody from the mainstream clergy to debate because in the case of evolution, it's really a religious issue. It's not a scientific issue. Now, with global warming, I would suggest the same sort of approach. It does not help the public understanding of science to, present, to pretend to them that there is validity to the idea that uh, uh, there's no global warming. Uh, I mean, because the, the consensus view in the scientific community is extremely strong on but there is a lot of room for opinion on what, if anything, to do about it. Right. And you can have debates on that. That makes a lot of sense. Our position at NCSC is that whatever society decides to do about the consequences of global warming, that these decisions be based upon a, a, a clear understanding of the conclusions of science. Uh, I think those decisions will be better made than if they are made just for ideological reasons. And here comes a whole stack of Great, questions. And, and so one of the questions there as, as we go on is you, you were very clear about the need in the science classrooms to teach just the science and not to address any of these policy issues. Well, not necessarily. I mean, I, for one thing, teachers don't have that. that uh, college, I taught at the university level. You have a lot more control over what mm -hmm. happens. You know, anybody who is a teacher here will know that te kids will bring up all kinds of stuff uh, on and off topic and just totally off the wall. And a teacher has to somehow deal with that. Doesn't necessarily have to discuss it in great detail, but you you know you have to do a little bit of that. Um, one thing that I one one little bit of ammo that I would suggest for teachers is that if a student comes in with uh, global warming, um, a contrarian literature, which is being distributed now and they get off the website or mm -hmm. Fox News or something like that. If a kid comes in with these arguments, uh, direct them to a site called skepticalscience.com. It's a wonderful site that has very understandable uh, analyses of the major global warming, uh, anti-global warming claims, uh, such as it's actually getting warmer or it's just the sun or something. And, and there's like a hundred of the top arguments. So 
any kid who comes in with literature, you know, rather than you feeling, oh, geez, I don't know how to answer this, because you don't. I mean, I don't either. Um, the thing to do is to send the kid to that site and have them root around. That's helpful. But the, the uh, policy issues can certainly be discussed in a social science class. You know, in a, in a history class or a modern problems class, or there are a number of, of social studies classes for which, uh, you know, should we have carbon tax or should we have a uh, cap and trade? That's a very reasonable debate to have. And we would hope that the kids on either side of this debate would support their views using science, certainly. But that gets you away from having the kids um, produce this false dichotomy, you know, produce this idea that there's some scientific legitimacy to these uh, anti-claims. Would you like to speculate as to um, who and why the deniers are being fueled as they are at this current, mo at this current moment? Well, I don't have to speculate. There's plenty of literature on this. Um, the, uh, there have been a, John Mashey, among other people, mm -hmm. have just done wonderful work in tracing back. You know, nonprofits, we 501c3s, have to submit something called a 990 form every year. And we have to list our major contributors. And John, bless his heart, has gone through so many of these for the Heartland Institute and a lot of other of the um, uh, nonprofit organizations that. Uh, uh, promote an anti-global warming uh, point of view. And uh, he, it's very easy to trace this money back to where it comes from. And a lot of it comes from uh, people associated with uh, fossil fuel industries, mm -hmm. um, our beloved Koch brothers among them. And, but also uh, some of the, um, the actual uh, coal and gas and oil companies themselves. They have a, they have a vested interest in uh, the public not appreciating the fact that the planet is getting warmer and that warming gases like uh, CO2 are directly implicated in this. So is maybe a better corollary? I mean, I, I see the, the similarities with the evolution debate and the climate debate, but this sounds much more like the tobacco debate, where there oh, were very powerful yeah. interests that didn't want the science to be there because they didn't want to change the policy. Yep. And in fact, a very good book by Conway and Oreskes, which I would strongly recommend to anybody interested in this topic, Merchants of Doubt, mm -hmm. traces the um, evolution, if you will, of this uh, denialist mentality uh, from the evolution wars to, uh, sorry, the um, anti-smoking campaigns where, you know, as we all know, the tobacco companies uh, uh, hid data and pretended as if there was um, valid scientific research showing that uh, uh, nicotine really wasn't addictive or that the other gases in cigarette smoke were not injurious to your heart and lungs and other portions of your body. So really it's science being used as to fulfill political objectives exactly. and not so, anything yeah, about the science. The and, the th and the same thing with the ozone layer. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're, they're, It's a wonderful book because she really traces through a number of um, different public scientific controversies where the science was very strong, but people with a vested interest, an ideological interest, uh, economic interest, um, tried to cast doubt on the validity of the science in order to promote their interests. And one of her chapters is on global warming. Right, right. Um, can you share your thoughts from the audience uh, regarding the language climate change versus global warming? Yeah. Um, I'm interested in communicating science. And I have found that sometimes words get in the way. I mean, words are how we communicate. This is pretty much a, a given. But sometimes we have, to, depending on the audience, sometimes we have to uh, choose words that don't create reflexive reactions. Um, in my decades of dealing with evolution as a controversial issue, I have found that the word evolution itself has been demonized in certain conservative mm -hmm. Christian circles. Uh, an anecdote, if you will. Um, physical anthropology friend of mine was teaching at a uh, community college in a, a southeast state. I won't mention Georgia. Um, and uh, she was... Um, uh, you know, this is, this is college A, and this is physical anthropology, so you, you get evolution from day one. That's just you know, part of the DNA of, of, the, of the discipline. 
And she had these kids that she found out from talking to local teachers who never had been taught evolution. Their teachers had just flipped through those pages and just never, you know, never assigned those chapters of the book and certainly didn't talk about it in, in class. So these kids um, really didn't know anything about the science of evolution. They just knew about the, uh, what they'd learned on the street, so to speak. Um, and uh, so she just plunged right on in and, and taught evolution. And after a couple of weeks, these two kids came up to her and they said, well, of course species change through time. You mean that's evolution? We thought evolution meant you can't believe in God. Now, I have heard so many variants of that story from high school teachers and college professors. There's this meme out there that uh, some, uh, this is that dichotomous reasoning that I was talking about. There, there's this, this view out there that you have to somehow choose between um, science, evolution, and faith, Christianity. And uh, therefore, the word evolution has become demonized. So what should teachers do? Well, you have to teach evolution. And what you need to do is use uh, what they call inquiry learning. Teachers know what I'm talking about. It's a way of taking into consideration what is in the student's mind before you start teaching. Um, uh, don't, you know, no student is a tabula rasa, right? No student is a blank slate that you just pour the information in, you know, like, like that Monty Python with the skull, you know, the pour. No, that's not how, that's not how education works. Um, you have to find out what's, what the student thinks about this subject matter, have the student recognize how his or her understanding of the subject doesn't jibe with the standard science, with what the teacher is trying to teach, and help guide that student work through mm. the misconceptions that, that he or she might have about the science so that at the end of the process, the student builds or constructs his an accurate understanding of what the field is. And so teaching evolution takes a few more steps than uh, teaching cell division. You know, students don't come into class thinking cell division means you can't believe in God. Big difference there. So you have to teach evolution a little bit differently, and you may be, have to be careful about language. Now, that was a roundabout mm -hmm. way of getting to your question about what do you feel about using the term global warming, uh, the term climate change. Um, we actually are uh, hoping to be funded to work with the uh, University of California Museum of Paleontology on a new website. Uh, the teachers are probably familiar with understanding evolution and understanding science, these excellent websites that get a million hits a month. These wow. are very popular websites. Check them out if you haven't seen it. We want to build a new website called Understanding Global Change which will deal not just with climate change, but with global change, of which climate change is a major driver. We're going to focus more on the biology since there's plenty of meteorology out there. But you know, climate change is, is really driven by global warming, right? So global warming, climate change, and global change are all part of a continuum, in one sense, of greater and greater complexity. Global warming has taken on, in some um, audiences, if you will, uh, the same sort of uh, demonization or negative connotation as the word evolution in some conservative Christian uh, environments. Um, so it might be more useful depending on who your audience is, depending on who you're talking to, the neighbor over the uh, fence, <laughs> your relatives. Um, depending on who you're talking to, you might not want to use the word global warming until you've cracked that door a little bit. Because if saying global warming slams that door shut, you're not going to get anywhere. And this actually fits right into the next question. Which is? Why aren't we speaking the language of conservatives, as in the economic ravages of climate change or creation care? Why not have a Q&A with the Department of Defense who are planning for climate change already in their military operations? I think it's extremely important to address the the economic and security concerns of political conservatives who reject global warming. And that is, the, I'm very pleased that the questioner uh, uh, brought that point up. I'm just going to second it. Uh, you know, it, it may be that many Americans don't accept global warming, but the military sure does. And the military is planning for the kinds of population migrations that are going to take place 
when there are severe droughts in Southeast Asia because the Himalayan glaciers are not getting replenished every year. And they're <coughs> making um, allowances and considering what will happen when you have large population movements in Southeast Asia and elsewhere away from the coasts when sea level rise gets uh, higher. Um, you know, the argument shouldn't be whether the seas are going to rise. The argument should be, is it going to be two feet or four feet? I mean, that is really where the argument should be, should be made. But uh, population movements require, uh, will produce political instability, and the military has to be cognizant of that if they're going to be doing their job. So even if uh, some of the um, uh, uh, civilian uh, leaders in Congress uh, don't accept global warming, I'm very happy that the military is, is, is taking that seriously. And the other uh, economic issues as well. Um, we, we had a huge crash of the codfish industry. That wasn't a result of global warming. That was a result of largely of overfishing, of, dis of disturbing an ecosystem. Well, when ecosystems are disturbs, disturbed, that has economic consequences. You know, a couple months ago, the USDA released its, I think they do it every 10 or 15 years, released their um, uh, gardening zones you know, I don't know how many of you saw that, but it was very striking uh, because uh, it showed that what we'd say in biology, the biomes, the, um, the, the belts of climate in the U.S. have all shifted north. You can grow magnolias in New York. Okay. Now, that is something that gardeners, oh, look, you know, look, at there, there's, this, uh, there's this new information on what I can grow, and that's always very much fun. But think about that in terms of, of something like agriculture. Uh, you know, should we all be buying farmland in the plains of, of uh, Canada? <laughs> but, but, you know, we seriously have to take these issues uh, uh, in, in, in under consideration. So, Jeannie, you Temperature and, and uh, humidity and, and rain. And so you've brought up the international component. And one of the things that really struck me last year, I guess it was about a year and a half ago now, we had the 20th anniversary of, of Will's Antarctic trip. And, and, and all of the people that were on this trip from Russia, from uh, England, from China were here. And, and, and I've had a chance to travel to other countries, China, uh, many European countries. And no one really uh, outside of the U.S. seems to doubt that climate change is real. What they're going to do about it is still in, in discussion. But is this a uniquely American issue, the, the, the science of, of climate denialism, denial? It seems to be. It seems to be when I, I'm not as aware of uh, the polling in other countries. But well, you go to Germany and they're reorienting their society yeah. in this way full steam ahead. Yeah, it's not a the, question Germany of if, is it's north a question Europe. of how, right. Germany right. is considerably further north than Minnesota. And they have invested hugely in um, distributed solar, in individual solar panels on people's houses and businesses. I mean, they're taking this seriously, exactly. And, and so one of the questions here was, what can we do in Minnesota? I, I can't su make suggestions for what your legislature should do in cooperating with Illinois and Iowa for regional no. um, climate change and energy use and stuff. That, that's like my that's job. Really, really, right. That's really, really cool. <laughs> I, I really <laughs> wish you lots of luck. But uh, in terms of science education, it's very important that climate mm -hmm. change be in the curriculum. And that's a problem because uh, I understand Minnesota is a little better than many other states. Um, climate literacy is part, as Will said, is part of, of your curriculum. Good for you. Uh, strengthen it. In most states, uh, climate science topics are sort of scattered throughout the curriculum, and it, it's really hard to, to find a locus for that. Maybe middle school, earth science, that's the place you're most likely to find it. It needs to be strengthened. Students graduating from your schools need to have a clear idea of the solidity, the solidness of the science behind it, um, and also the, uh, the consequences. I mean, they, they need to be introduced to the ideas that global warming is going to make changes. And as a society, we have to make decisions about how we're going to cope with those, dis uh, those changes. So really um, talking even about adaptation when you're teaching science in the school? Well, you know, get the students thinking about, about these, these things. Mm -hmm. uh, the students themselves can often come up with, um, 
with good suggestions. Gee, we ought to be using less water. How do we use less water? How do we generate uh, less waste food? You know, could we have some sort of recycling in the cafeteria? I mean, student projects have been um, uh, uh, springing up all over the country. Uh, just sort of local individual interest, uh, generally, of course, uh, stimulated by a teacher who gets an environmental club going or something like that. But those are the sorts of things that I think can be very helpful. You know, ultimately, uh, we have a huge problem with fossil fuels mm -hmm. and the fact that uh, there already is a very large reservoir of CO2. Even if we stopped generating mm -hmm. fossil fuels tomorrow, we're, the planet's still going to continue getting warmer just because of the, of the um, um, uh, direction mm -hmm. of, of change that, that, that is still extant. But that said, even though that's a huge problem. It's important to get individuals involved in thinking about this. Um, it is possible for individuals to make a difference. Um, if nothing else, to be aware of the issues and to elect the right uh, congressmen and state representatives so that the proper decisions are made at the national and the state level as well. And that requires an educated citizenry, and that's got to start in the schools. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been just a wonderful conversation. I wanted to open it up. If you have any last closing comment you'd like to leave us with, and then we can. Well, there's so much to talk about. I know. <laughs> We're just getting started. This, this is very true. There's, there's much more about all of these things. Um, we're very concerned at NCSC with evolution education, education in the nature of science, and now climate change education. But we see all of these as tied, and ultimately, they, both the evolution issue and the climate change issue come back to really understanding what the nature of science is mm -hmm. and why science is such a powerful way of knowing about the natural world. It gives us much more accurate understandings of how the natural world works than any other way of knowing that human beings have come up with. Sure is a whole lot better than my gut feeling about next week's weather. Um, <coughs> So we need to do a lot, I think, with helping students and the general public mm -hmm. understand you know, how science works, um, how scientists come up with the conclusions that they come up with. It's not just from you know, sitting around uh, the coffee table at the uh, student union BSing with your colleagues. It involves a lot of very hard work. Um, proposing ideas, testing those ideas, throwing out the ones that don't work, provisionally keeping the ones that do work, um, go back and start all over again, and it's a, in a, it's a very tough iterative process. Like I say, nobody promises you a rose garden when you go into science. Let me just say, say one thing that's really Please. annoying. Um, hopefully not annoying to you, but uh, one of the things that, that as a scientist I have been very concerned about and, and dismayed at is the, what I see as a growing attack from the public, particularly from the anti-global uh, uh, warming uh, side, on science itself. Mm. Uh, the idea that science is just another way of knowing, that it's not uh, what we consider it to be the, the most valid and the most valuable way of understanding the natural world, that uh, scientists are just in it for the money. How's that working out for you? <laughs> you know, if I was going to come up with a get-rich-quick scheme, probably wouldn't be science research, actually. I would probably go into the oil and gas industry, all right? You know, who's going to be making more money here? I mean, this, you know, the idea that, that climate scientists are part of some big, big um, conspiracy to keep from you members of the general public the real truth about the weaknesses of the science, because they just want to keep those research bucks rolling in and keep their, their, uh, their laboratories going. Oh, really? You don't suppose Chevron wants to keep their money rolling in? I mean, get a grip, guys. <laughs> Let's step back and look at the, at the big picture. Where is the money in this? It's not in some poor schmo's science uh, research laboratory at the university. <laughs> Not this schmo. I was actually which way is the university? I should be pointing at the university. No, no, you're, you're in it. You're, you're, it's okay to point at me. All um, right. But all anyway, thank you Small so much ramps. for coming. If we can all just thank Jeannie. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone.